Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's Michael Wong and Dr. DeVita doing another veterinary neurology live Q&A. Um, so please put your questions in the comments and um, we'll get to them today. Uh, a, a couple of things, um, please share this on your page and hopefully uh, we can get lots of engagement here and lots of people asking questions. Um, quick reminder, our Jupiter location is opening August 4th. Dr. Christine Seneca uh, will be the neurologist there. So um, very, very, very excited about that. And it's going to be pretty amazing being able to help patients just a little bit further north than our Miami and our Boynton Beach office. Um, and then just the other thing, we are doing our second annual Seven Synapse uh, Veterinary Neurology Conference. So that is going to be August 4th, excuse me, October 4th. Um, it's an all day event. I believe there's six or eight CE credits. Uh, we're going to have lectures on various veterinary neurology topics. Also one on uh, syncope and cardiovascular conditions that can mimic neurological disease, as well as uh, imaging in veterinary neurology. So um, our First caller actually um, is ha had to cancel on us. Uh, um, we don't have one until 1.20. So um, I do have a question that was submitted. Um, it says, it's from Paula. Hello, my seven-year-old rescued Shih Tzu was recently diagnosed with meningoencephalitis after presenting a wobbly walk and head tremor slash head bob movement. The vets first suspected it was back pain, then intervertebral disc disease. After seeing five vets, she was finally referred to a neurologist and they confirmed the meningoencephalitis diagnosis with a spinal tap and MRI. She is on cyclosporin and prednisone. After four weeks, we are starting to reduce her prednisone about 15%. The vet said it was not viral, fungal, or bacterial. So we are trying to think about every possible factor that might have triggered it to avoid a relapse. What would be the main activities slash food slash habits that could trigger the inflammation? And what are the first signs we should look for if we suspect a relapse? Thank you. Um, so again, seven-year-old Shih Tzu uh, was showing an ataxic or wobbly gait and some abnormal movements of the head, saw a couple veterinarians, um, eventually got a diagnosis of MR, excuse me, of meningoencephalitis by MRI and spinal tap is on prednisone and cyclosporin. Um, so Dr. Vita, if you wanna chat a little bit about meningoencephalitis and you know, the, our, our, approach, our approach and our thoughts there, and then we can get to her specific questions of what to avoid. Okay. Um, so meningoencephalitis in dogs or um, meningitis is another word that you'll hear us using or um, meningomyelitis, which means inflammation of the um, cells that line the spinal cord and the brain and the spinal cord. All of those kind of refer to the same disease process. So to break it down a little bit, meningitis means inflammation of the meninges or the cells that line the spinal cord. Myelitis means inflammation of the spinal cord and encephalitis means inflammation of the brain. Um, so just to kind of explain if you hear us using one term or the other, we're essentially referring to the same disease process. In most small breed dogs, um, meningitis or meningoencephalitis is going to be autoimmune in origin. There's a very small percentage of dogs that have an infectious component um, to meningitis or, or encephalitis, um, but that percentage is very small. And when we have a dog who fits the breed predisposition. So a young Shizu or other small breed dog like Yorkies, Maltese, those are the types of dogs that we think of that um, are the quote poster children for meningoencephalitis of autoimmune origin. Um, treatment unfortunately is uh, typically- what, what, what do you mean by autoimmune? I guess, can you break that down for- um, So. Autoimmune disease is essentially when the body turns against itself. Um, so the immune system typically helps to fight things like infection, um, you know, other insults essentially to the body. In an autoimmune disease or disorder, the immune system is inappropriately fighting the normal parts of the body. 
Um, so I, I liken it a lot to rheumatoid arthritis in people where the immune system is fighting the joints inappropriately. But in meningoencephalitis, the immune system is fighting the nervous system inappropriately. So I, you know, in kind of the most layman's terms that I can find, I typically say the immune system has gone a bit haywire. Um, so it's kind of ramped up and doing too much, um, whereas it, it's up here, whereas it should be functioning down here. And that higher level of functioning has caused it to attack the body inappropriately, essentially, um, because it thinks that there's something wrong when there is not truly something wrong. Um, hopefully that that was a good explanation. Um, when we have a dog or human with auto, an autoimmune disorder, um, typically treatment is lifelong or very long term. Um, the goal of treatment is to find the lowest effective dose of medication. So um, kind of like you said your neurologist was doing, we start at immunosuppressive doses of medications, meaning medications that shut off that ramped up or, or haywire immune system um, to kind of render it down a little bit to hopefully stop that attack on the normal parts of the body. And long term, we want to find the lowest effective dose that does that without causing side effects and without predisposing the dog to having a, an immune system that's too weak to not be able to fight off other types of infections. So it is a little bit of a balance. Um, typically dogs with an autoimmune disorder um, have what we call a guarded prognosis, meaning that about 30 to 40% or so do well. We taper their medications, we get to low doses and they do quite well over time. Another 30 or 40% depending on what, which paper you read, um, you know, they'll do well, but they can suffer relapse, just like a human with an autoimmune disorder can suffer relapse. Um, and then about 20% or so, 20 to 30% just never do quite as well as we want them to do, um, no matter what medications we use or how aggressive we are with treatment, unfortunately. It's really tough for us to predict which group any pet or patient will be in um, without just treating them. So essentially treatment and time is the best way for us to tell, will we be in the top you know, 40%, the middle 40% or, or the bottom 20%. Um, and we never wish for that bottom 20%, of course. Um, so I, th I think that was a kind of abbreviated uh, summary you know, for, for what I usually talk to people about. So uh, again, it's usually not viral, fungal, or bacterial. Um, for, for the vast majority of dogs, if they're that small breed, classic, you know, three to seven year old small breed dog and classic MRI and classic spinal tap, I, I often do not do infectious disease testing. If the dog's got something um, atypical about it, if it's a large breed dog, if it's out of our, our typical um, signalment or typical age, um, if there's a, a, a travel history kind of outside of South Florida, yeah, we'll do more or more likely to do infectious disease testing. Um, so uh, Paula, one of Paula's questions was, what would be the main activities or food or habits that could trigger the inflammation? Um, I, I feel like that's a common, or excuse me, common question of, you know, well, what caused my dog's immune system to go haywire and how can I avoid it in the future? Yeah, I, I don't think I have a good answer for that, just because we haven't really identified any specific causes with certainty. Um, so there's a, a few papers that have looked at, are there triggers essentially for autoimmune disease? Um, one of them recently looked at the environment. So was the dog in a city as opposed to a rural area? Um, the weight of the dog, the age of the dog, the sex of the dog. There's a small female predisposition, but it's very small. Um, so I think there was about 60% females in that study and 40% males, give or take. Um, so it's a relatively small predisposition for females. Um, but we haven't quite identified, is there a certain food? Is there a certain environmental allergy? You know, is there something from the outside that we can eliminate exterior to the dog um, that would help to either prevent it from happening altogether or prevent relapse in the future. The one thing that I'll mention is that when we've identified meningoencephalitis of autoimmune origin, um, we don't want to give medications that can then stimulate the immune system because that makes us worried about a relapse. Um, so the main worry there is dogs being vaccinated. The 
point of a vaccine, the whole goal of a vaccine is to stimulate the immune system to build protection in the body against whatever we're vaccinating for. Um, so dogs with meningoencephalitis are typically advised not to vaccinate um, if it can be avoided. Obviously some um, counties, states have different laws, um, but if it can be avoided, we like to avoid vaccination and anything else that is known to stimulate the immune system of those dogs. Great. Uh, anything else you think we should, should chat about? Um, so what, one of her questions was also, first signs we should look for if we suspect a relapse. Yeah, so typically if, if these dogs are gonna relapse, they're going to start with the initial signs that they presented with. So I would look for, you know, it sounds like things like back pain, scuffing the toes in the back legs, weakness in the back legs. Um, so any difficulty walking, things like that. Sometimes it can be quite subtle, um, but you know, kind of watching him each day and especially during those tapering periods when you're lowering the medications to make sure that, you know, in that immediate period of lowering the medications, we don't see a big change because that might be the time and it might not be the time, but might be the time that we see something that tells us, hey, let's back up, let's go back to the higher doses for a little bit extended period of time and um, potentially rethink our long-term plan um, because obviously we never want to see recurrence of the signs, especially during that tapering period. Yeah, so so I usually coach people on, you, you, you kind of said that 40% do great, never look back, 40% have relapses, 20% uh, you know, don't respond at all. And, and I often feel that middle 40%, if we're going to have a relapse, it's usually within the first six months or so. Um, not a hard and fast rule. I've got dogs that you know, go do great for years and then relapse years down the road. When that happens, we kind of have to think, have the thought process of, well, is this something new versus is this a relapse? Um, I agree that usually when there's a relapse, the symptoms are very similar to the initial ones, but in theory, the inflammation can pop up elsewhere in the CNS or in the nervous system, and we could have different symptoms. Um, I also think one of the things you said is, yes, sometimes it can be subtle, sometimes it can be vague, and those are things that I want my clients, you know, taking note of, but I don't want them losing sleep that, you know, hey, he normally, he normally circles twice before pooping, but he circled three times this time. Is that you know, does that mean that there's a problem? So um, it's, it's a fine line of looking for the subtle stuff, but not driving yourself crazy over that subtle stuff. So, um, so great. I, I hope that was useful for you, Paula, and for anyone else that has a dog that might be showing signs of, uh, of meningoencephalitis. I, I think one of the other important points in here was, gosh, you know, um, I saw five different vets and, um, you know, some of them thought that it was intervertebral disc disease. And that's a, a really important thing because intervertebral disc disease is the most common thing that we see that causes things like back pain and wobbly walking. But the point is that without a diagnosis, you know, I mean, seven-year-old Shih Tzu that's walking funny, yeah, we think slip disc, you know, as, as our, our first concern. But as uh, your dog showed here, um, meningitis or meningomyelitis was actually the, the, the cause. So we have to keep our minds open that we don't have a diagnosis until we have a diagnosis. And there are other things that can look just like the more common stuff like intervertebral disc disease. Um, you have any yeah, questions in here? So thanks, Corinne. Thanks, Bonnie. Thanks, Emmy. Uh, Luana, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, anyone that's watching again, if you can just share this on your feed, I, I'd appreciate it. And that way it can hopefully reach more people. Um, Kareem says, hello, Dr. DeVita is awesome. Um, Dr. Wong operated on my mini dachshund four years ago and he's done so well since then. Recently, I took him to the Boynton location as he was showing signs of back pain and I was advised to crate him for three weeks and give him medication. He's walking fine now. But my question is, if I don't get surgery and this flares back up, is a wheelchair an option or is operating the only option? Um, so uh, Dachshund operated four years ago, did well, um, is now showing, or excuse me, showed signs of back pain, um, was seen in our Boynton office, and we're treating him with rest and medications. The question is, 
if I don't get surgery and this flares back up, is a wheelchair an option or is operating the only option? And rem remind me, um, he's walking still, correct? It sounds like he just showed, and, and maybe you can ask, um, Claire, Kareem, sorry. Um, our, our assumption from your, from your post here is that he's walking now. He's just showing symptoms of back pain, um, but he's able to walk. He's not dragging his back legs or anything like that. He's just showing symptoms of back pain. Um, we'll, we'll start answering that way, but Corinne, if, if, if we're wrong, um, go ahead and, and comment yeah. to us. That's what I was gonna say. So, so um, my, our hope is obviously that with the course of crate rest and potentially medications, if they prescribe some medications, that your pup will get better. There's always a chance in the future, especially given um, his history, that he may have a disc problem, whether it be the same site currently affected or a different site in the future. I typically don't recommend a wheelchair for a walking dog. Um, so um, a better recommendation or a more appropriate recommendation, as long as he's still walking, in my opinion, would be continuing crate rest, even considering physical therapy, um, even if he gets better from this particular incident or flare up, um, may just help to strengthen him, improve his coordination, and um, obviously not knowing the, the body weight of your dog, but um, keeping him lean is really important for any dog with a history of back problems. Even though we call it physical therapy, I kind of tell owners that it's more like working out. So it's more like exercising, just improving your strength, um, improving your kind of body fitness overall will help, just like in humans, um, to protect from injury in the future. Um, so I wouldn't submit him to a wheelchair based on what I'm picturing is happening right now. Obviously, if in the future, Sure, he loses the ability to walk and surgery is not an option um, and he doesn't recover with medical management. That is, you know, that is a potential in the future, but I wouldn't quite jump to that. I'd always try rest and medications first um, if surgery is not an option. Yeah, yeah. so for, for me, a wheelchair is for a dog that is never going to walk again. A dog that is paralyzed with absent deep pain perception and um, hasn't gotten better. So um, so, so Corinne answered, he's walking fine. He's just a little uncomfortable. Um, so yeah, it, it sounds like this time, you know, our symptoms are very, very mild, meaning, um, you know, j just uncomfortable. So absolutely. I, I think the rest and medications route, uh, is, is the way that we should be going. Um, and Dr. Reese and, and Dr. Webb, uh, recommended up in Boynton. We'll usually do four weeks-ish of crate rest, followed by four weeks of room rest, followed by four weeks of house rest. And we're usually checking in with you frequently to make sure we're getting better. If we're either not getting better, we're getting worse, or we've plateaued at an unacceptable level, that would be the time to consider shifting gears and moving to, to tests. Um, if tests and surgery aren't an option, um, medications are always an option. Um, so for dogs that are like your pup that um, are just showing signs of pain, there's like a 70% you know, chance that they're gonna get better with rest and medications. As symptoms get worse with becoming wobbly or even not walking but still moving the limbs, assuming it's a slipped disc, there's still a very good chance that with rest and medications and physical therapy, acupuncture, et cetera, that you know, so there's a 60, 65% chance that your pet will eventually regain the ability to walk. It might take longer than with surgery. The recovery may not be as complete as with surgery. The uh, likelihood of recurrence is higher than with surgery, but you know, a dog that, that can't walk um, still has a very good chance of getting better with rest and medications. When we start getting into dogs that can't move their legs anymore, those that are paralyzed but can still feel the legs, the chances go down a little bit, but we still have, you know, 55, 60% chances with enough time, rest, medications, rehab, et cetera, that they can get better. But those are dogs that we really, really lean towards or strongly, more strongly recommend things like tests and surgery to prove that it's a slip disc. And just with surgery, we've got like 95% chances of walking. So it's just a much better prognosis. So get, getting to your question about you know, a wheelchair, for me, a wheelchair is for that dog that is category five, 
that is paraplegic, no deep pain, and either had surgery and was the bottom 50% that didn't regain the ability to walk, or surgery and MRI wasn't an option and was that, um, that, that 95% chance that they would never walk again. So let me say that more clearly. Um, if a dog is paraplegic with no deep pain perception, with surgery, we have about a 50% chance of having them walk again and about a 50% chance that they do not walk again. They're permanently paralyzed. So that is a scenario where a dog goes to a wheelchair and they have a fantastic quality of life. Um, I had a, a dog for 11 years in a wheelchair and you know she had the best life ever. So the other scenario would be dog that is paraplegic, no deep pain. If the owner says, hey, just MRI and surgery isn't a possibility, the likelihood of that dog ever walking again with rest and medications, physical therapy, et cetera, is, is about 5%. So that means there's like a 95% chance that, that dog never walks again. Those are the ones that um, would also be a candidate for a wheelchair. So um, right now, Corinne, I mean, a wheelchair isn't on my radar, isn't on Dr. Reese's radar, isn't on uh, Dr. Webb's radar. I'm not sure which, which one of our neurologists he saw up in Boynton, but um, wheelchair is not in the, in the cards right now. Um, yeah, and that's the good news. I think we can all agree that, you know, we can make him feel better without, without that. Great. Well, um, it looks like Rebecca is here. Hi, Becky. Can you hear me all right? Hello. Yes. Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm Dr. Wong, Mike Wong, and this is Dr. Montana DeVita. Um, I guess, can you tell us a little about Luther? And he's a 10 and a half year old Chihuahua Pomeranian mix? Yes. So he's 10 and a half um, Pomeranian mix. We kind of started symptoms uh, last weekend. So we're on approximately day 10. Um, he started out with just yelping every time we picked him up and then went to um, kind of nipping at that back right leg. Um, it then progressed to um, him not really being able to stand on his own. Um, every once in a while he would take steps around our backyard and then uh, sometimes he would just look at us and ask me pretty much to move him he would just not want to move. So um, from there, I kind of escalated to him not even standing on his own and then not being able to get up. So we kind of progressed what I thought quickly, but after reading it, it's pretty much a standard story with it. Um, they started him out on um, Rimadil on, so about three days after we, he started showing signs, he was on Rimadil. And then they, um, they told us he had arthritis to begin with. So they gave him an injection um, for that. And, um, and then on Thursday, when he started to become a little bit more um, anti-mobile, he, they prescribed him gabapentin. And we've been on that since. Um, by Sunday, we brought him to the emergency vet because he was no longer functioning. His, he didn't want to move, as I stated. So we brought him to the emergency vet. Um, they did blood work. They didn't do any x-rays there, um, but they did do an EKG because he does have a heart murmur. So uh, they potentially stated that he could have, it, it's more neurological because when they would tap his feet next to a table, he kind of dragged his feet and he didn't lift them up to put them on the table. Um, so they thought potentially either um, a heart murmur or, or I'm sorry, uh, a brain tumor or um, something with his his neck within like a disc um we had an appointment the next day at our um, our standard vet and they my dogs are gonna argue now <laughs> and then so from there they um they did an x-ray and they noticed that they had a bulging disc or they they didn't really for sure say that it was a bulging disc because he said he can't confirm it um without doing uh an mri uh, but he felt pretty confident that he what he saw was IVDD. Um, so actually today he started his first round of acupuncture with chiropractic. Um, I actually just got off the phone with the vet and they didn't see any huge uh, improvement with the first session. So our plan of action now is to do three days of intensive care, to do laser therapy, 
um, and acupuncture with chiropractic with it. Um, and then they're taking him off of the Rimadil. They're going to slowly get him off of that and put him on Prezidone okay. to get him on a steroid. So that's kind of our story. Is, is he there with you now or is he still at the hospital? He's, he's at the hospital. So he's okay. going to stay there and they're going to have him on fluid. So I actually just got off the phone with the vet. Okay. So, um, I have two other dogs. So. Okay. It, it, personality wise, I mean, level of awareness. I mean, when he sees you, does he, you know, th does he wag his tail and get excited? I mean, th does he seem aware of what's going on? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. He's very aware. Um, he doesn't wag his tail. Um, that's kind of just been between his life for the most part, but he, he's very alert to what's going on. He's, he wants to know what's going on. He'll bark when someone rings the doorbell just like he normally does. So he's, he, he's very much there. I would say it's just, okay. it's just, he's confused as to why his legs don't work. And, and is he unable to, so, I mean, if, if you stood him up right now, would he be able to, to take one or two steps or does he just kind of collapse under himself? He would just collapse. Okay. So okay. And, and I think he's a pretty severe case. <laughs> Okay. Unfortunately. So, so what we can say pretty confidently is all four legs are affected. He's painful, and he seems he seems alert. Is that? Yeah. Um, the doctor today said he he doesn't seem like he's in pain. Um, you he even could you know massage his spine, and he doesn't seem affected by. It. He doesn't seem like he's in pain. Um, but he if he stands up, he's, he doesn't move. I could position all four legs to. Um, you know, get him to stand is just, I obviously I'm not going to put that pressure if he's not ready for it. So I, I'm, but, but correct me if I'm wrong, when it, when it started, he was crying out and yipping and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When I pick him up, he would, um, he would yell, yeah. but he still does it every once in a while. But since he's been on medication, it, it's gradually, you know, decreased. So I think, I think the meds are helping. So obviously it's impossible for us to, to, to know based on, you know, not being able to examine him or see him, but um, whenever a dog is acting painful, you know, we ask ourselves, is it a, a bone and joint problem? You know, has he injured something or is it a neurological cause for pain? Once we start not being able to walk and, you know, our, our, our limbs are buckling over, that's something that suggests a neurological problem. So from there, you know, Dr. DeVita and our thought process is, well, where in the nervous system is the problem? And, and that's kind of what the emergency doctor and, and your veterinarian and the acupuncturist are, are all trying to sort out of, is it a problem in the brain? Is it a problem in the spinal cord of the neck? Is it a problem in the back? Is it a problem in the nerves and muscles? So um, Brain problems or balance problems, um, neck problems, and then nerve and muscle problems are kind of the three things that I think of when I hear of a dog that can't walk in all four legs. Um, you're not really saying anything that's suggesting a brain problem, so um, you know behavior, level of alertness, things like that. So I'm, I'm going to assume that it's not a brain problem. And most nerve and muscle problems aren't painful, so I'm my conversation is going to be assuming that it's a neck problem, which just based on painful 10 and a half year old Pomeranian Chihuahua mix that came on relatively suddenly, um, progressed rapidly, I, I suspect a neck problem, which sounds like what, what your veterinarians are, are all suspecting. Um, yeah. from, from there, when we're in person, we're trying to assess how severe it is. Um, the most mild form is just pain. So that's where it sounds like it started like a week ago where we were still walking with painful. Um, category two or the next severity would be if we're able to walk but are wobbly. Three is when we can no longer walk but we can move our legs. Um, four is when we cannot move our legs and five is when we cannot feel our legs. So uh, it, it sounds like you're describing a, a, a three, which means he's not strong enough to stand and take steps on his own, but if we supported him, that he'd be able to move them just a little bit. Is that, is that fair? Is that, is that kind of what you're seeing? Um, 
I think his front legs are much more mobile than his back ones are. Um, the one thing that the vet said that was reassuring is that they pinched his back legs and he flinched them. He knew there was pain and he did them when he was being pinched in his back legs. So he still has pain receptors. So I would, from, you know, what I've read too, you know, potentially a three or four, I would say um, without meds, I would definitely say a four. He'd probably have no motivation to even move the front legs, but I, he's definitely not completely paralyzed. He, like even this morning in the kennel, um, I went to go get him and he was doing spins and circles with his front legs trying to get to me. So um, he's, so maybe he's I, very I, aware. Maybe I was picturing incorrectly. So it's, he's pretty good pulling himself with his front legs, but his back legs are dragging behind or? Yeah, he's not mobile at all. If I put him up on all fours, he's he's pretty, he would probably tip over. I haven't done it in a few days. Um, I've been kind of giving him a little bit more rest, but um, I would confidently say he would he would just tip over. So, so. I, I, it's it's hard to say for sure. Um, he does have some buckling in his front if I put him down, um, okay. but yeah. So, and, and that's enough for me to go back to the conversation that it sounds like a neck problem. Um, the yep. possible, the things that we see in 10 and a half year old small breed dogs that can cause pain, come on suddenly, um, may not necessarily be painful later um, and, and get worse over time. Um, I guess get worse and then maybe come up just a little bit. The number one thing that we see is a slipped disc. Um, what a, a, a disc is, the um, dog's spine has multiple bones and in between each bone there's a disc that acts kind of like a cushion and gives the the bones mobility or you know a, a, a place to, to move um, and we use an analogy of discs like a, a jelly donut there's an inside jelly part and an outside donut part and what a slip disc is is when the inside part leaves the donut and presses on the spinal cord so the spinal cord is kind of running above the disc within the bones of, of the vertebra. So the most common thing that we see in small breed dogs that comes on suddenly causes these sorts of symptoms is when that inside part of the disc comes out and presses on the spinal cord. But there are other things that can look the exact same way. Things like meningitis. Um, he's a little on the older side for meningitis, but it's certainly not impossible. Unfortunately, we worry about things like tumors um, so not necessarily a brain tumor, but dogs can get spinal cord tumors. They can get infections in the spinal cord or even in the bones, and that can cause pain and sometimes difficulty walking. Um, we do see certain malformations in chihuahuas. Um, if, if you told me he, he was a 10 and a half month old chihuahua, we'd be talking about things like atlantoaxial instability, where the first two bones in the neck um, just become dislocated. It's still possible. I've seen it in a 10 and a half year, or in 10 and a half year old dogs, um, but just it's much lower on the list there. So in an ideal world, the best way for us to find out would be by doing tests. Um, X-rays can usually show us things like broken bones, obvious tumor of bone, obvious infection of bone, and that instability. So those are things that you know we, we can make much less likely on the worry list because you've done x-rays, but can't completely take them off the worry list. Um, so what, what are our typical options? Option one is usually doing an MRI. Any dog that's kind of a three, four, or five on that severity, um, we want to be doing tests sooner than later because just based on the severity, the likelihood of getting better with tests and potentially surgery is much higher than trying medications. Um, but we get it, you know, dogs that have heart problems, dogs that have other problems, kidney problems, et cetera, sometimes just anesthesia and surgery is an option. Um, so what are, you know, what, what are the chances of getting better with rest and medications? It depends on what the underlying cause is, but assuming it's a slip disc, you know, 55 to 65% chances that he can get up and regain the ability to walk. Again, based on the assumption it's a slip disc and based on the assumption that it's a disc in his neck 
and he's still able to move his legs, which it sounds like what you're describing. So, um, so your question of, you know, have we ever seen any other stage four pups that walked without surgery? Absolutely. Um, you know, kind of 55 to 65% of the dogs that we see that have a category three or four in the neck um, that their owners aren't able to do um, MRI or surgery, 55 to 65% of them will get up and walk again. It can take time. It might take longer than with surgery. We might not, you know, get all the way up to here. We might get to here where we're still, we're walking, but we're still wobbly. Um, what helps? Um, I mean, to me, the, the biggest thing is, is time and rest. Um, part of that time is pain medications. If he's painful, so I think you had said, you know, he was on Rimadyl and Gabapentin and, and a muscle relaxant. Um, I, I think those are all reasonable. Many times prednisone can be a, a miracle drug. Um, so I, I think it's reasonable based off of the severity that you're describing to do exactly what your vet is saying is, well, let's take him off the Rimadyl, give a washout period. Um, so a, a time where he's not on any anti-inflammatory before starting the prednisone. Um, the reason we do that, just switching from one to the other can cause things like stomach upset and uh, stomach ulcers, bleeding ulcers, things like that, diarrhea, vomiting, um, just that, that sometimes can be worse than the, the not walking part. Um, so yeah, switching to prednisone is absolutely reasonable. Um, acupuncture, physical therapy, um, Many neurologists, you know, get a little uneasy when we hear things like chiropractic adjustments. Um, you know, when, when I envision chiropractic adjustments, I, I envision, you know, manipulating the neck and stretching it or manipulating the back. And just dog discs are different than people discs. Um, so I, I worry a little when I hear the word, you know, chiropractic. Um, that can mean a lot of things and, you know, you may have someone that's actually doing, you know, things like massage and acupuncture and, and laser therapy. So I guess I don't want to um, raise concerns of, you know, oh my gosh, am I doing something wrong? But w when I hear chiropractic adjustments, like, you know, twisting the neck or, or the back, I, I feel pretty strongly of, of um, that that can make things worse. So. Okay. Have you seen like laser therapy be beneficial? I, I, I do think that there's a place for laser therapy um, in, in dogs with neurological disease, especially when there's a strong indication, either a diagnosis or strongly suspected that it's something like um, a slipped disc or uh, a, a spinal cord stroke, which isn't really high on, on my worry list for, for your pet, um, but just answering the question about, uh, about laser, um, I guess I worry a little bit more um, with laser of, do we know what we're treating? Um, meaning, could it be something like meningitis or myelitis? Could it be something like a tumor where the likelihood is laser isn't going to help, you know, or in theory could actually worsen things or at least delay a diagnosis. So um, most of the, the rehab doctors that we work with down here, they're very proactive about, you know, ideally, you know, when someone comes to them, they'll say, ideally, you'll go and get a diagnosis so that I know will rehab, whether it's acupuncture, um, laser, et cetera, actually help your pet. Um, so yes, there's a place for, for laser based on what you're describing. Um, I suspect your dog has a slip disc. Obviously, I have a lot of holes in, in my puzzle right now um, to make a strong recommendation, but I don't hear anything that, you know, makes me say, no, you shouldn't be considering a laser. Anything have, to add, Dr. DeVito? Have you, like, would meningitis, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Please. Would, um, would meningitis show up on, like, blood tests? You, you want to talk no. a little, Dr. DeVito? Yeah. <laughs> meningitis in, in dogs is a little bit different than in people. We get that question quite a bit. Um, so meningitis in dogs and people, is diagnosed on a spinal tap, but often our blood work is very, very normal in dogs with meningitis. 
Um, the body does a really good job of separating the brain and the spinal cord, so the central nervous system, from the rest of the blood. Um, there's actually a barrier in between the blood that goes to the rest of the body and the nervous system. It's because it's such a, a sensitive part of the body that we want to kind of filter things that don't belong there. So that makes diagnosing meningitis difficult because by the same token, not all of the cells and, and things that are in the nervous system end up in the peripheral blood or the blood that goes to the legs and the front legs and, and things like that. Um, so okay. meningitis can be diagnosed on a spinal tap, which uh, does require anesthesia. So that's a spinal fluid analysis. It requires anesthesia in dogs, not all the time in humans. Um, and spinal taps in dogs are a little bit better tolerated than in humans. Um, and we can do them in, in different areas of the, the spine than we do in humans sometimes, not all the time. Um, but to kind of long answer to your question is, unfortunately, we can't often see evidence of meningitis on peripheral blood work. Our job would be a lot easier if that was the case. <laughs> um, but um, it, it would require anesthesia for him. And it sounds like that's um, of a, a relative concern given the heart murmur. Um, okay. Yeah, I, our vet almost didn't recommend an MRI as well just because of the um, the dye and stuff with him, so, or the, the fluid that goes in. So, um, yeah. even reading the symptoms, I'm, I'm fairly confident it's a slip disc. I, mean, I clearly don't have the education behind it, but um, just knowing his symptoms and reading uh, the different stages and saw how it progressed, it, it definitely aligns with um, this disease, a uh, slip disc, so. Yeah. It's certainly the most common thing. I, I guess what I'd, I'd I, I'd say is, you know, I think you're on the right track. I think, you know, for the reasons you've said of anesthesia and heart murmur, you know, we, we try a non-MRI approach. Um, I guess I wouldn't completely rule MRI and surgery out just based on a heart murmur. Um, I mean, we, we MRI dogs, we anesthetize dogs with heart murmurs all the time, but it's one of these things of what are the pros and cons. So if you're trying this rest and medication standpoint or, or, or approach, and it's not getting better, you know, at some point we either need to, um, you know, accept where we're at, make tough decisions, or shift gears into doing tests. But certainly I think it makes sense to do what you're doing. Let's try the, the <clears throat> more conservative, you know, less invasive anesthesia route right now, um, you know, given all the things that you've said, but I wouldn't completely rule it out um, of, of doing tests. You know, if, if, if you called me in a, a week and said, you know, hey, he's, he's no better, he's even a little worse, he's getting painful again, um, I would have, you know, very little hesitation. Um, and I'd have, I'd almost say no hesitation if, if I actually examined him and had been able to look at him of, of saying, gosh, you know, 10 and a half year old dog with a heart murmur, but can't walk, I, I would be doing an MRI. Um, I think to put a positive spin on it, um, just on a positive note, if he gets, if in a week you, you comment on our page and you say, well, he's 20% better, he's still not walking, but I see more movement, that's pretty encouraging. Um, it'll take time for him to get better, but small improvements are still improvements in the right direction. So um, just kind of keep on keeping on and, and definitely, you know, keep us posted on your page, on our page, if you're able to, we'll, we'll want to know how he's doing. Yeah, de sure. definitely. I, I didn't mean to, to <laughs> have a negative spin on it. I'm sorry. Thank you for, for um, yes, I mean, our expectation is that he'll continue to improve. I, I think a, a point in there is don't expect a change overnight. You know, we're looking at what are the trends? Are we moving in the right direction? Um, Absolutely, yeah. We're we're definitely going to be patient with him. So he comes home on Friday after his uh, multiple treatments. So we're we're kind of taking it from there day by day. Awesome. Perfect. But yeah. You have any other questions? I do not. I thank you guys so much for your time. You got yeah. it. It's our pleasure. All right. Good luck. Yes, thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Did I get all negative there or just? No, I just did. I wanted to end on a high note. I know. I, well, I, I wasn't sure was I doing my thing and not seeing her and her face was going like this and I, I wasn't aware. So, um, 
Yeah, I, I, I didn't by any means. I expect, based on what she's saying, you know, if we've improved from here to here over the last week, you know, that, that we'll continue to improve. Um, right. I was trying to make the point of a heart murmur or age or, you know, you know, isn't an absolute uh, contraindication for, for anesthesia reforming. Yeah. Um, so we've got, Jane has a question about her five-year-old English Springer Spaniel named Gus. Um, sounds like he's having episodes that are described as um, picking up the back legs, uh, lifting the left front leg straight up. Um, his back arches, his body contorts to the left. He's unable to stand on his own. It sounds like he's aware, but looks out of it. He just sort of freezes. Sometimes his head shakes. Um, it lasts a few minutes, you know, three or four minutes. Um, he tested positive for Ehrlichia at the end of April. That's around the time when he started having these episodes. Um, curious to see what you all may think. He has been on a low dose of potassium bromide, which has helped tremendously. He hasn't had any seizures, um, and he just went off a little less than a week ago and had two today. Sorry, let me read that again. Very curious to see what you all may think. He has been on a low dose of potassium bromine, which has helped tremendously, parentheses, no seizures. He just went off a little less than a week ago and had two episodes, I'm, I'm assuming two episodes today. Um, first comment, I love that you said y'all the first time because I say y'all all the time. And so I feel like I'm rubbing off on you. Um, <laughs> second comment. Um, so I'm interested to like visualize what the episodes look like for nothing other than my own curiosity. Um, they don't sound like your classic generalized seizures where we think of dogs falling over, paddling in their four legs, and um, foaming at the mouth, having uh, uh, chomping of their jaw and losing consciousness, sometimes losing um, their bowels and their urine as well. However, given, and correct me if you disagree, but given um, Gus's response to potassium bromide or perceived response to potassium bromide, um, there's certainly a, a possibility that they're atypical seizures. Um, so I always tell people seizures can kind of do whatever they want sometimes. So oftentimes they'll look like what we think of and what we'd imagine a seizure looks like, but sometimes they look nothing like what we would imagine they would look like. And especially if all of the episodes look pretty similar um, and given the, the response to therapy. Um, so um, I guess my general thoughts are um, potassium bromide is a, a great anticonvulsant medication. Um, if he responded to it initially, um, you know, it's reasonable to say that these are seizure like events or atypical seizures. Um, and that he may need an anticonvulsant medication, especially given her, his perceived relapse of the episodes when coming off of the medication. Um, I'm assuming that all of the episodes are looking the same, um, even the ones that happened after uh, he came off of the bromide. Um, in terms of the cause for them, um, I guess I've never seen an infectious meningitis because of Ehrlichia. I don't know if you have. But I imagine they can have a vasculitis that causes little little stroke-like events, um, you know, that then can cause seizures or, or the clinical sign that looks similar to seizures as well. Yeah, I, I guess I would say possible, but I wouldn't put blinders on and say that it's because of Ehrlichia, yeah. um, which I think is what you were you were getting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so other there are lots of other possibilities too in a five-year-old English Springer Spaniel. Um, they can have idiopathic epilepsy, uh, which we've, we've talked about a few times on our Q&As before, so a genetic predisposition to seizures. They can have meningitis, which we just talked about, although I've, I guess we don't see many Springer Spaniels um, of autoimmune nature with an infectious meningitis being much, 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 much less common in dogs. Um, you know, they're not the typical breed for something like a congenital problem. Um, you know, other things are, are possible to be the cause of the events. Um, my suspicion would be that they, again, that they are seizures and that potentially Gus will need a more long-term anticonvulsant therapy to keep the events under control. 
I'm also curious, I guess, you know, how did we stop the bromide? Did we stop it right away or did we taper off? Um, because that could, um, you know, could also affect our, our clinical signs too. So, or, and how long we were on it. April, May, June, June. Somebody during audio, but she's ready. Okay. Yeah. So, 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 Jane, I, I know that you've been uh, texting with Emily and, and, and you're at work. If, if you can kind of, um, you know, l let us know of uh, how long we were on the bromide and how long we've been, been off of it um, before having the, the two episodes today. Do you have any other other thoughts with the information we have right now? Um, I, I agree. You know, we have to think things like atypical seizures. You know, I, I think the fact that we responded to an anti-epileptic drug, um, and I guess I, I wouldn't put blinders on and call it due to Ehrlichia. You know, to me, this would be a a seizure type workup. Um, description of the episode, video of the episode, um, CBC chemistry, chest films, um, MRI, spinal tap. Um, that would be my approach in trying to narrow down what the cause is. Um, who is this? Yvonne. Hi, Yvonne. Can you hear Hi. us all right? I am. Uh, uh, you've, it's Dr. Wong and Dr. DeVita here. How are you? Good. How are you? All right. Uh, what, 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 what kind of pet do you have? What's going on with it? Um, um, I have eight. a two-year-old German Shepherd lab okay. mix. And he has um, seizures. Okay. He's had them since he was about five months old. And we thought it was the food. So we started, we started changing. Well, He's been to numerous vets, and they just kept changing food and changing food. The poor dog doesn't know what he's supposed to be eating. Um, we took him to the neurologist, and so I mean, at this point, he's on five pills a day for phenobarbital at 100 milligrams, uh, four pills a day of 750 milligrams of Keppra, potassium bromide. So we we went to another vet that actually does like acupuncture. We haven't done the acu acupuncture because we've done all kinds of tests. She's ran for thyroid. She's done sonograms for her stomach um, because she's sort of in agreement with me that we don't think this is just, they, they keep just saying it's idiopathic epilepsy. And she's like, I don't believe that. It's too consistent. Like it doesn't just happen. I don't know where it happens. Every three weeks, like clockwork, um, his eye will turn red. He'll get diarrhea. He'll have seizures. We'll have seizures all night long, seven, eight of them all night long. And then in the morning, eight, nine o'clock in the morning, he'll stop having them and he'll be a little bit, you know, not right, but he's sort of back to normal. So wh wh where do you live? Pittsburgh, PA. Okay. And so the seizures started at five months of age. What, what do the seizures look like? Their grandma, their full-blown grandma. And sometimes he'll have clusters of them all night. Uh, has it always been clusters he, or? He never has just one seizure. Okay. No, the, the minimum he's had is four. And it, I think it's because we got, um, the neurologist gave me my dazepan to put in his nose. And I think that that brings, that brings him down. But I mean, we've went seven or eight of them. But what started making us think that it's not epilepsy is the two times I've had him at the emergency vet, within a week, like a week before, the first time, jumped up on the counter and he got five um, steaks and ate them raw. Had him at the emergency vet. Um, the next time was like a couple months later, he got up and somebody had put ground meat to thaw out and he ate five pounds of ground meat. So we were thinking gastro and you know, something gastro which doesn't seem to be the case or allergic to beef doesn't seem to be the case but we still it's still like clockwork like we can pretty much count down on us to the day of when he's going to have them and, and um 
So you, you've seen a neurologist, you've seen a, a lot of veterinarians. It sounds like you've done a lot of tests. Um, th th does a bile acids test, does that sound familiar? Has anyone talked to you about like a liver shunt? Um, uh, we did do liver shunt and he didn't have that. Okay. And, and did you do an MRI or, or a spinal tap with the neurologist? We did not. We okay. did not. And you said not that I wouldn't do it. They just never, they just, to me, it just seems like, okay, he has idiopathic epilepsy and we're just going to keep out of medicine. I mean, the poor dog's on probably 20, 14, 15 pills a day. And I do see a difference in him. Like he's not the same. He's not a puppy. So when I went back to my vet, I said, we need to get him off of something. It's not working. It's just the same thing's happening. Like, why does he on all this meds? So we did start weaning him off of the Keppra and we were doing really good. And then all of a sudden he started having them again. So then we were like, okay, that's, if the Keppra's working, let's put him on the Keppra and take him off the Pheno. So we're sort of in the midst of doing all that, but we sort of stopped because he was, he had one last week. So we yeah. stopped. So, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of that, of what I'm going to say, you've already heard from, from your vets and from your neurologists, but um, just for me to bring other people that are watching kind of up to speed with my, my thought process, I, I might repeat things that you've already heard a hundred times. Um, okay. A seizure is an abnormal burst of electrical activity in the, the front part of the brain, what we call the cerebral cortex. And I tend to think of seizures as three main causes. The first is something outside of the brain that affects the brain, like low blood sugar, like liver problems, uh, severe kidney problems, toxins, poisons. Sounds like we've ruled that out with blood tests and bile acid tests, et cetera. Um, Correct. The second broad category of causes of seizures is something physically wrong inside of the brain. Um, things like brain tumors, strokes, encephalitis. Those are usually the, the first things that I say, um, but I think all of those things are much less likely just since he started having seizures at five months of age. Um, and since they've been going on for you know a year and a half and you're not saying things like he walks in circles or anything like that. Um, so what are the things inside of the brain that we can see in five month old dogs. We can see malformations. So sometimes dogs will get um, fluid pockets or misshapen brains um, where just the brain doesn't form properly and they might act completely normal otherwise, but they have seizures. Sometimes those dogs do have abnormalities on their examination where they're blind in one eye or tend to walk in circles or things like that. But um, young dogs can also get infections um, and that can cause things like seizures. Uh, I, I guess, I think it's a little less likely given the time course, but that's possible. The, the third main cause of seizures is idiopathic epilepsy. And that just means recurrent seizures that aren't due to a problem outside of the brain like low blood sugar and aren't due to a problem um, inside of the brain, like a tumor, meningitis, malformation, et cetera. So we, we, we can't know for sure that your puppy is, uh, um, has idiopathic epilepsy until we've done an MRI and spinal tap to look for a physical structural problem inside of the brain. Okay. Um, what are the things that fit with it being epilepsy? Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong in some of my assumptions here, but he, the fact that he's normal between seizures, it's not like he's um, getting lost or staring at corners or walking in circles or dragging his legs or anything like that. Um, and, and well, he, lately when he has the seizures, I've noticed he does drag his leg. Right before it or during it or right after? Afterwards. Okay. For, for how long? I mean, is it just... Well, this last one was for... but. I was out of town when this last one happened and a friend had him. So I texted my vet and she said to make it easy on him, give him the diazepam. So I did. And every time we give him the diazepam, he sort of reacts slow for four days. It must stay in their system a long time or something. So it, this one lasted probably for two days. Dragging is not dragging it, but like, you know, when he walks, it sounds like he's dry, like it's rubbing. Kind of scalping his tongue. Okay. So, so some of the things that fit with idiopathic epilepsy are, you know, he's not showing dramatic abnormalities in between the seizures. Um, there's a regular rhythm to them. So, you know, when, when I hear things like 
I think you said it's like clockwork every three weeks. Um, when I hear stuff like that, that actually does support things like idiopathic epilepsy. Just to me, one of the things that isn't classic of idiopathic epilepsy is the, is the fact that the seizure started at five months of age. Um, we usually think of dogs with idiopathic epilepsy having their seizures start between one and five years of age. Uh, doesn't make it impossible. It just you know kind of puts it outside of our our, our bell shaped curve where you know ninety nine percent of dogs with epilepsy you know will be between that one and five years of age. Right. Um, you know what could you be doing? Um, it, it's tough for me to recommend what to do with the medications. You know, I, I certainly get it that he's on 14 pills a day and still having seizures every three weeks and there's still seven or eight of them. I think it's easy to throw your hands up and say, well, gosh, are these medications doing anything? And um, the, the likelihood is that they're doing something, um, but they're not getting it to uh, the point where we, we would like it to be. Um, so I, I guess I don't have a lot of recommendations on, you know, which medication to, to take away or which medication to start. Um, I'm sure your doctors, I'm sure your neurologists are sort of checking the levels of the phenobarbital and the bromide and possibly even the Keper to make sure that they're in that, that therapeutic range that we're not underdosing. Um, or that yeah, they're, they're checking them. They, now the, the neurologist, we, we've only seen him twice, I think. The last time I talked to him, because he, he's the one that prescribes a midazepam for me for emergencies. Right. Um, he had suggested two different medications, Topramate. Yep. And it starts with a P, pra Praga. Um, I didn't get this one filled because my doctor told me not to. Um, oh gosh, I can't think of the name of it. So we never even started him on that. But the biggest fear was, is how much more can we keep medicating this dog before we're doing damage to him? That was our fear. Yeah, and, 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 and that's, you know, your, your doctor's uh, approach, um, and that's your neurologist's approach as well. You know, for any dog with seizures, we're trying to find the balance between, you know, the downsides of medications, you know, you having to give all of these medications, him having to take all of them, the side effects of it, what are the long-term effects, what are the costs, you know, what's the, the cost of, of you having to, you know, be, be home three times a day to give them? And uh, you're, 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 so Dr. McKillop, is, is that your neurologist in, in Pittsburgh? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm sure he's, he's thinking about those things and balancing those things. Um, you know, but just when we hear things like seizures every, every three weeks, um, you know, we're, we, we, we feel the need to, to try something um, and, we'll often start with one of these, what we call like a first line medication, whether that's phenobarbital or Keppra, and then um, we'll add in another medication. So we're, we're trying to, for lack of a better term, you know, uh, educated trial and error, find the drug and or combination of drugs that decreases the number of seizures that your dog's having and gives it the best quality of life. Um, so I, I would suspect that the idea with behind adding the, the tapiramate would be, gosh, hopefully this is the drug that helps your dog so that, yeah, now we can start taking away some of these other ones. And, and that's oftentimes our approach. Um, so there's no guarantees that adding a fourth or a fifth or a tenth drug are going to stop the seizures. Um, quite frankly, we, I shouldn't have said stop the seizures. We, we, we never expect Close them down. We're just trying to aim if we could get it to be one seizure every three weeks or a cluster of seizure every eight weeks instead of a cluster of seizures every three right. weeks. Um, th th that's what your, your team's going for there. So I, I, I would be really hesitant to say that it has anything to do with eating the, the raw meat from the, um, from the countertop you know, at, at five months of age. Again, anything's possible, but I think that's really, really, really unlikely. Well, we were thinking because he wasn't, I don't think he's ever really had a normal bowel system. Let's put it that way. Like he's always mushy. I mean, I give him fiber. I give him um, unflavored Metamucil in his food. So it does come out a little bit more solid, um, but it never fails. 
it's either right before or right after he has the seizures, he gets complete mush again. And then I've noticed in the last six months, he'll go back and he'll eat it. If I'm not, if I don't get it immediately. So I was like, okay, this isn't working for us. You're not going to do this. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, to me, I agree under, under a year seems like there's something else going on. That's why we were going towards irritable bowel or something like that. Yeah, I, I, I saw your question on here. I, 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 I don't often draw a, a link um, between irritable bowel and idiopathic epilepsy or, or seizures in general. So um, it sounds like you've got a couple different things, you know, that, that weren't being looked into. The, um, you know, the, the, the GI stuff, I guess it doesn't really bother me that much that he, he's trying to eat it now. Um, dogs do that. It's, uh, yeah. Um, I... I think it makes sense, you know, to 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 keep your neurologist involved. Um, I'm I'm not sure, you know, um, if if looking for an underlying cause um, is a possibility. Meaning the MRI and spinal tap, um, you know, hopefully it's all normal and we can say, okay, it's not a physical problem in the brain, and that way we can focus our efforts on medications. Whereas if we were to find an underlying cause through an MRI, I think one, we'd have an aha moment of, gosh, this is why um, he's had such a hard time getting seizures under control, um, but two, may also alter the, the treatment regimen. So if that's a possibility, you know, I would talk with, with Dr. McKillop about that. I would talk with your primary care veterinarian about that. Um, okay. And I, I, I completely get the concern for adding a fourth or fifth medication. Um, but you know, n none of us want to just uh, keep throwing medications at a problem. Um, there, there's definitely a reason that he's doing that um, and, and, and a system. So um, I, I think there's value in you know, keeping him as, 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 as part of your, your team there. Would there be a reason why, um, um, well, in December, I think it was December, I had him in the emergency room. He was running a fever, it was January, December, January. He was running a fever. It was pretty, it was, it was extremely high. Like we literally had to, well, I couldn't carry him up because he's 150 pounds, but my, my son had to carry him to the car because he couldn't even move. When we got him down there, um, he had a fever. And they have no clue why he had a fever. Like they've ran all the tests and everything. But from that point on, we've pretty much been on, um, actually from that, when he came out of there, he was on an antibiotic and he was on steroids. We went 65 days without a seizure. We, and then now he's still on the, the steroids because when I take him off the steroids, he starts scratching and chewing his feet and nose and all that stuff. So we keep him on the steroids. Like that to me triggered something like, this doesn't seem right. Why go 65 days at that point? Yeah, no, it's, it's certainly interesting. I guess it's hard for me to, 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 to give you an answer on why that might happen. Um, you know, I, 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 I wonder, is there something more systemic going on just between the GI? Um, I, I, I missed when you were talking about the fever. So that wasn't like associated with having seven or eight seizures. Any no, other? absolutely not. No, I just noticed that he wasn't himself. He was just laying away. I mean, he's a, he's a puppy. He's a 150 pound puppy. He loves to play. He loves to run around. He loves to try to jump on you. Um, and that day he just, even when I brought, brought treats out, he was like, mm, I don't want them. I don't want nothing to do with it. He would not move from where he was at. And when I, he actually jumped up into my bed and I was laying there and I was like, Oh my God, you're hot. And I waited to see if he cooled down at all thinking I, I mean they're hot because they have a lot of fur and he was getting hotter and hotter and I finally said to my son it was like two o'clock in the morning I said get him in the car he's not right. this is not good and we took him down and I think they said it was like a hundred and I could be wrong because we've been through so much <laughs> um 106 I, I, I think really, they said I, I would certainly I mean is this is certainly complicated there are at least a lot of things going on whether they're all related to each other 
you know, is tough for me to, to say. I do think it warrants, you know, um, further investigation. It's, it's not classic that we see, you know, dogs with seizures that also have fevers and also have GI stuff. So it might be three unrelated things, um, but I, I'd say there is a chance that they're related and warrants further, you know, evaluation. So if, if you're right there by the, 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 the specialty center, you know, I think they're going to be able to, to, to help you. And then we'll just write a medical book on them. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, it <laughs> happens. All okay. Right. I, I, I that, thank you. I, I mean, sometimes you just need another opinion. Just to, yeah, definitely. Your thoughts and I, gear. No, I mean, it's I, heartbreaking. I, I mean, you just sit sit there and see him go through that, and then he'll he'll get up and he's fine. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not fine now. <laughs> like, it, I, it's, I, I, it's I, not I get good. scary. You know, you, you you just want what's best for him, and um, you know, you never know, you never know what to think. Um, I, I, I mean. Uh, Dr. McKillop was in his residency, you know, just a couple years before me, and I always thought he was one of the smartest people I'd ever met. Oh, I think he's awesome. I mean, he's he's an awesome doctor. I mean, it's it's very hard to get in to see him though, but he is an awesome doctor. Alrighty. Well, well okay. best of luck. Um, I, I I would I would keep looking at at, at causes um, of the the fever, the GI stuff, and um, I would certainly look into further causes for the seizures. Okay. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Amanda, ready? All right. Let me think of this one. Yeah. Right. Hey, Amanda, can you hear us all right? Oh, you're going to need to turn on your, your audio. Oh, there you go. go. Can you hear me? Hi, how can are you? you? Good, how are you? Doing? Better. Okay, That's awesome. So, um, thank you for taking my call, first of all. Um, second of all, we have an eight-year-old uh, female Doberman who on um, last Sunday, so it would have been the, sorry, the 12th of um, July, she had an FCE stroke. So we had come home from work and she was just, she couldn't move her left leg, her rear left leg. So we rushed her to emergency and the following morning she had lost her second leg. And then the following morning, so the Tuesday, she had lost all her pain, her deep pain sensation, or if that's what it's called. Um, so we were worried that it was something more than FCE. She had an MRI. They couldn't exactly tell because there was just so much blood. She has a really bad case of it. Um, there was so much blood? So much blood, yeah, in, in, her, in her stroke or yeah, winter spine, sorry. <laughs> this is all new to me, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and so she, we ended up uh, getting her home on Thursday of last week. So she has like, no, she's incontinent completely at this point. She still has no deep pain apparently, but we started her with um, the acupuncture and the laser therapy. And we've been doing like range of motion and all the physiotherapy kind of stuff that we could do for her. And um, we noticed that the day after she started kicking her back legs a bit more. So the only thing is, is that we're being told it's reflex. So I'm just curious, like, how do you know the difference actually between reflex versus her actually maybe starting to feel something? Because she also is starting to nip at her side. So I don't know if that's her getting feeling back or if it's just me being too hopeful. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Davida. Thanks. Yeah, I was just waiting. Um, so <laughs> reflex. Uh, so dogs do have what's called a withdrawal reflex. Um, it sounds like that's maybe what your veterinarians are thinking that you're seeing at home. A withdrawal reflex is elicited when you stimulate um, the toes or the webbing between the toes. And the reflex is that the dog draws the leg back and, and kind of flexes all of the joints in the leg. Okay. That's an unconscious reflex, meaning that there are nerves that go from the toes, they enter the spinal cord, but then go right back down to the toes um, to kind of tell the leg to do that reflex. There's no involvement of the brain in that reflex. Okay. When we're talking about pain sensation, we're looking for a conscious reaction to a painful stimulus. So 
Um, again, pinching the toes, even though it's the same type of pinch that you're doing, we'd be looking for your pup to, you know, tell you in some way that they can feel that, whether that's turning around and looking, whether that's a change in the respiratory pattern, so breathing more heavily, um, you know, whether that's trying to bite or yelping out um, because there is a, a painful stimulus that they are consciously perceiving. Okay. So that's kind of the difference between our pain sensation um, and our reflex. So um, when we're looking for um, voluntary movement as well, we're looking for the dog to kind of kick their legs on their own, whether that's, you know, when you're when she, she or he is laying down and you're standing across the room and, and calling your dog, um, do they try to kick to get over to you? Or when you're supporting underneath the belly, you know, is there advancement of the limbs? Um, so those would be the kinds of voluntary movements that we'd be looking for that indicated um, improvement in, you know, in the overall status, neurologic status. Okay. Um, and then, I mean, um, have you guys seen cases where like they've lost the deep pain and it's come back maybe weeks later because like our neurologist like honestly doesn't seem optimistic at all and I mean I understand because it is apparently a very bad case and I mean I just I know I'm probably just grasping at straws here but you know I, I just wonder like is like have you seen it come back like a month later or like have you seen improvement in these like the really bad cases uh, so me again uh <laughs> So yes, I, in, in my limited experience comparatively to Dr. Wong and your neurologist, I haven't seen an FCE that made a dog lose deep pain perception yet. Uh, Dr. Wong, do you have any, any input there? So I don't think I have enough um, data to, to share an appropriate opinion. Um, it, it, it's a similar answer, Dr. Vita, for, for um, you know, dogs with slip discs that we do surgery. So. I, I, I don't want to take away all of your hope, but when we have a dog that's unable to feel the limbs and it's due to you know, fibrocartilaginous embolism, the prognosis is less than 50% chances for regaining the ability to walk. Um, I, I give it time. Um, I, I tend to give a little bit more time than many of the neurologists that I've worked with um, for saying when feeling can come back. Um, you know, mo most of us kind of say two weeks or is the cutoff if it hasn't come back in that time, it's not going to. And if it doesn't come back, then that pet is not going to be a voluntary walking dog. Um, I've had a handful that have taken a month, um, but I've never had a dog beyond a month magically regained feeling in the back legs. So, um, you know, at, at this point, I, I wouldn't give up. I would be starting to sort of, you know, mentally prepare myself that, that, you know, the, the chances are stacked against us, you know, but presumably she's not painful at all. Presumably from the waist up, she's, you know, very, very happy. Um, and, and you're helping with the, the poops and the peas and things like that. And you're getting used to that sort of management. And usually what happens is in that month that we're giving that dog to regain, giving that dog time to regain feeling, if they have not regained feeling, most owners say, well, gosh, I've been doing this for the last month. You know, I'm getting the hang of it. It's not so bad. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're seeing it's, it's a little bit more challenging with a, you know, a, a big dog than it is with like a chihuahua or a dachshund, um, yeah. but it can still very much be done. Uh, I don't know if your neurologist has talked with you about a wheelchair or anything like that. Um, we're what? gonna go back to see him in a couple weeks, like, cause it like it hasn't been two weeks as of yet. But so I mean, I think he's he, he's just worried about her size because she is like thirty two inches tall mm -hmm. and like ninety pounds. So I mean, it it that becomes a little bit of a thing that we really have to consider, right? So, I mean, <laughs> I guess we're like, what kind of therapy would you guys suggest that might give her a better chance, if that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, at this point, physical therapy, acupuncture, et cetera, are, are all the things that, you know, you, you should be doing and um, a, a, everything you can. So physical therapy, acupuncture, you know, if your neurologist is recommending laser, things like that. Um, but there, there's not a surgery per se or a procedure per se that's going to help this. 
Usually yeah. there aren't medications that help fibrocartilaginous embolism. Um, you know, if, if your neurologist has prescribed a steroid or something like that, it's, you know, it's, it's not wrong, especially in this severity, but um, typically for things like FCE, there isn't a medication that, that we prescribe. Yeah. Um, going back to, you had kind of talked how, how your neurologist had said, you know, just because she's so tall. Yeah, for, for me, there are a couple of things that, that um, predict the likelihood of regaining the ability to walk um, with an FCE. And the, the, the first and foremost thing is, can they feel the legs or not? That deep pain perception or, or, or feeling or nociception, that to me is the biggest one. When they can't feel the limbs, you know, we, we go down to that less than 50%. Um, yeah. If it's involving what we call an intumescent, so if it's involving a part of the spinal cord that, that is actually uh, where the, the origins of the nerves that go to the leg, whether it's the front leg or the back leg, if those are affected by the FCE, um, that is a, a negative prognostic indicator. And you know, for me, uh, uh, I guess the third thing that isn't quite as strong, but is just the size of the dog. Just you know, it's yeah. st standing up a big Doberman versus you know, getting a corgi or a dachshund to stand up um, and, and walk is is just harder to do. So yeah, um, exactly. yes, I, I would be <laughs> concerned as well. You know, I think you're being coached appropriately of, hey, it's probably not going to happen. You know, you've done everything you can. You know, you came into the emergency, did an MRI. You know, unfortunately, we found something that there wasn't something for the neurologist to swoop in and fix, like a slipped disc. Mm -hmm. um, and I know it can be frustrating, especially for someone like you that I can tell is willing to do just about anything um, yeah. <laughs> to, to, to be told, hey, we're doing everything we can, you know, and and we just need to give it time and see if it's going to happen or not. So, um, okay. So I guess like what we'll do is we'll just continue on with the ther the therapy. She's getting it like twice a week currently. So I mean, I mean, all we can do is hope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I would continue following your neurologist recommendations and you know just a anything that they recommend that that is in your power to do. I, I would be doing that at this point. Um, you know, for me, kind of after that one month time period. Um, me as a neurologist would start sort of coaching you towards, hey, you know, miracles still happen, but, um, you know, we need to be starting to prepare ourselves that she needs to be in a wheelchair, et cetera. Um, yeah. I, I would follow your neurologist's uh, guidance there in that um, he or she has the luxury of, of seeing your dog in person. Okay, thank you. Also, um, have you ever seen, like, she started to, after the therapy, started nipping her sides. Could that be a sign that she's getting something back, or does it not necessarily mean anything? Um, I, I guess when I hear of a dog that's lost feeling that now starts nipping more at, at the toes as opposed to the side, um, it's, it's one of these double-edged swords. It's kind of good in that it makes me think, well, gosh, is some sort of feeling coming back? But it makes me worry that is the feeling coming back an abnormal sensation um, that is going to cause her to start chewing at her toes and dogs can what we call self mutilate where they they'll, they'll chew their toes off or chew their tail off. So um, I, I, I hope it's the positive that it means some sort of feeling is coming back. Um, right. You know, it may be completely unrelated, but I, I guess what I would take from it would be keep a close eye if you notice that she's starting to get aggressive about chewing on toes and things like that. Um, or chewing at her side, that's something to involve your neurologist to make sure that we're, we're not going to get into a, an she even worse them. situation where she's, you know, <laughs> chewing off toes. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you guys so much, and uh, I appreciate everything. <laughs> Got it. Thanks for getting on. I, 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 I saw you. Um, I, I can see pictures of her, of her here, and uh, you're, you're yeah. not supportive, so. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Best of luck. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Dr. Vita, I, I realized that as, as I was talking there that I was also being the, the, the <laughs> was, was I scaring someone again talking about chewing off toes. So, um, yeah. I, I, I don't mean to scare. I, I, I'm trying to, um, I guess, prepare people for the different scenarios. You know, I, I, I hope things get better. What I feel is my duty is to bring it up so that you know, someone's heard. I think it's a good point because if you don't warn someone, 
probably be quite alarmed by something like that. Um, where did the, the question go? I think it was Janine, was that? Oh yeah, this one. All right, um, and, and for, for all the people here that are, are putting questions in the, in, in the comments, um, you know, if, if any of you are willing to, to come on and talk with us or, or um, do the audio or video, I'm sure you can tell it's just a lot better for us because we're able to interact, you know, ask clarifying questions. Um, so it's, it's just a zillion times better. We're gonna keep answering questions from the comments, um, but if any of you are willing to, to, to get on here with us through Zoom, um, I think we're better able to help you and I think it will help a lot of other people uh, to be able to hear these questions. So um, Janine has a question about her 13 and a half year old boxer and then uh, there was someone else here that, that said, hey Janine, I've got the same, or, or, or Marcy said, I'm, I'm following, I've, I've got the same question. So Janine has a 13 and a half year old boxer. Um, she's three legged, a front leg amputation that started having seizures last year. We immediately took her to the emergency room. They prescribed, prescribed Keppra three times a day. They told me they, told me they would say with 99% certainty she has a brain tumor. However, when we took her to her vet, I was told the opposite. My vet said she was angry. They told us brain tumor and would not assume anything. Uh, that seizures can be caused by many things. We have been documenting the seizures and seizures and she can go long periods of time with no seizures and some days she has two or three of them. I called her vet when she's had three seizures and they said to just keep doing what we were doing and keep her comfortable away from steps, etc. At her age, I'm assuming this is the best course of action. Is there anything else we can be doing for her? She went over a month with no seizures. We monitor her by camera when we aren't home with motion sensors and she had two in one day the other day. I just feel awful for her. She has no idea what is going on, but I'm wondering if you have any suggestions. Thank you. So 13 and a half year old boxer, um, concern for brain tumor versus not brain tumor. What are other things that we could or should be doing um, at her age? Cool. Um, so 13 and a half year old boxer just had seizures. It's been a year, you said, since the seizure started? I don't think it was it. I didn't get that, sorry. Um, I might have made that up. Uh, started having seizures last year. So okay. I don't know if that was uh, December or January of last year. Um, so certainly, you know, there are lots of causes, as we've kind of talked about today and um, on previous uh, Q&As, there are many different causes for seizures. And um, again, we'll be making a little bit of assumption that there was some level of testing done. Um, the first group of causes for seizures um, are going to be problems outside of the brain that affect the brain. Um, so things like liver problems, kidney problems, low blood sugar, toxin ingestion, um, which would be quite, uh, toxin ingestion in my opinion would be quite um, unlikely because she'd have to be getting into the same toxin, you know, over and over. Um, but assuming that your veterinarian uh, did blood work or the veterinarian that you saw initially did some blood work, um, you know, those things are easy enough to rule out with blood testing. The second group of um, things that can cause seizures or diseases that can cause seizures in an older dog would be things like brain tumors. And um, boxers are overrepresented in terms of older dogs with brain tumors. So certainly it's a possibility. Um, things like strokes are possible as well. Um, even if there was only one stroke at one point in time, that still creates kind of a scarred area um, that can act as a seizure focus or a, a starting point essentially for a seizure in the brain. Um, other things would be less likely in an older dog. So other inside of the brain things like, um, you know, meningitis, infections, congenital malformations, all the things you've heard us talk about for some of our younger patients. Sure, they're all possible, but much, much less likely. So for the inside of the brain causes a stroke and a tumor would be our top um, kind of differentials or possibilities. And then as you've probably heard us talk about today, idiopathic epilepsy. Um, so basically a genetic predisposition to epilepsy is also possible. Um, much less likely in my opinion in a 13 year old dog. Um, so what can we do from here is the question. Uh, in, in terms of testing, as we've said, you know, an MRI is the best way to know, is there an inside of the brain problem? 
um, that we can do something different for. I'd be curious to know what her leg was, why her leg was amputated. Was that, you know, six or seven years ago? Was it recently? Um, you know, what the underlying condition was that, that led us to that decision? Um, because potentially, you know, is there some relation there? Um, you know, for example, if there was a tumor in the leg, that would make me a lot more concerned about a tumor in the brain. Um, you know, so testing is certainly possible. Things like MRI scans will tell us, is there a structural abnormality in the brain? Um, so is there a tumor? Is there a stroke? We could also consider, you know, well, lots of dogs with tumors, if it's been, let's say, a year, a year and a half, we would see progression, meaning um, you know, some abnormalities in between the seizures or more difficult to control seizures, um, you know, and, and again, not having some of that information makes this tough, but, um, you know, if it's truly been an extended period of time without significant progression, do we focus more on the, you know, the stroke possibility and look for underlying causes of a stroke? We do things like thyroid testing and urine testing and checking blood pressures, Strokes in dogs can be caused by underlying abnormalities, um, so same as in humans. They can also be, um, you know, without an underlying identifiable cause, more of an idiopathic cause for strokes. So it would be another kind of road to go down in terms of testing. And then the last, I guess, recommendation is, do we alter her seizure protocol to try and get better control of the seizures? Um, so again, a little bit tough not knowing her weight and her current dose, um, and having a, a log of her seizure frequency, what the appropriate changes would be. But that's also something you could explore. Um, you know, you could explore other medications to add in depending on her frequency and severity as well. Um, so I think that would be, um, you know, that would be my recommendation is considering um, testing, including a metabolic stroke workup and or an MRI um, and then altering the seizure protocol to try and get better, um, better control of the seizures.